in sociology, and she is going to be talking to you about the issue of reentry, so prisoners uh, leaving uh, prison and the problems and issues they face when they're in society. Um, I ask that you give her the same respect that she gives to me, as well as make sure that you ask any questions. Her PowerPoint is posted on Blackboard for you for your final exam and all the information that she's covering today. Um, it's fair game on your final exam, so you want to make sure that you take it. So with that, there we go. Yay. All right, as Instructor Collins mentioned, I'll be covering reentry today, and she kind of gave you a little brief over cap. But really, today's take-home message, this is what I want you to get from this PowerPoint today. So reentry is an important part of our criminal justice system that society really needs to address. Frequently, people don't associate reentry with the criminal justice system since it takes place after people leave. However, it's really important that we address this issue because it affects the rest of the criminal justice system. And as you will see in the rest of the PowerPoint, we aren't addressing it. Um, this is just an overview. You don't really have to write this part down. Um, but today we're going to be covering the basics on reentry, um, what it is, why it's important. And then we're going to have a little fun activity, at least I think it's fun. <laughs> um, and then we'll come back to the PowerPoint and talk about what makes reentry successful, uh, implications of reentry, who's involved in reentry, and um, possible solutions. And I'll be able to get your feedback after this. So reentry is, um, as Instructor Collins mentioned, reentry refers to the transition of offenders from prison or jail back into the community. This is the time after people are released when they're trying to get back into the community. Frequently, they come back with very little to nothing, and they don't have a lot of support. So reentry just refers to that transitional time. for a lot of reasons. Um, I know you guys have covered recidivism at least a little bit in this class, um, but really reentry is the key to reducing recidivism. Um, approximately 637,400 people are released um, annually, and that means that there are 637,400 people that are just thrown back onto the streets and have to go through this process of reentry. Um, unfortunately, as I said, you guys have covered reentry, about 7 out of 10 will then reoffend and go back to prison. This means that without a successful reentry process, these offenders will just keep cycling through in what's known as the revolving door concept. of the people in prison currently will get out at some point in their lifetime. That means 95% of those prisoners have to go through reentry. Re some of them will be there for a long period of time. Others will just be put in jail for a couple of months. But regardless, the process is arduous.
NDICC Ohio is um, a website that is used to um, basically put everything together about reentry and what uh, restrictions are on uh, prisoners <coughs> reentering. So if someone commits a specific crime, uh, they may not have access to the same employment, uh, to the same benefits, to the same social wel welfare system that they previously had, all because they committed some, um, some specific crime. And so the website allows you to search by either keyword, which is down here, kind of cut off. Um, so like you can um, type in certain <coughs> payments, opportunities for uh, licenses, and it will tell you who can and can't receive those after they've been arrested. And then on the <coughs> other option is offenses. You can type in specific offenses, uh, and it will tell you um, what a person with, who committed this offense can and cannot do. So if you go over here and type in, who wants to give me an example of an offense? They give the example at the bottom of theft or assault. It doesn't, it can be anything really. Burglary? Okay, so of course we have two types, um, burglary and aggravated burglary. And um, if someone committed burglary, you can go over here to the offense feature. Down here, it would list um, it would list the impact of uh, what this offense actually means. So, someone who committed a burglary um, can no longer it can no longer be employed with long long term care um, through the Department of Aging. Same thing for the next one. Uh, they also can't be employed at state or at Head Start agencies. So if that's like with little children, um, it's a program to basically uh, help provide assistance for uh, for lower SES children to get them back to where they go, back to the average. Um, they can't be involved in preschool programs. They can't adopt a child. There's just so many. This, as you can see, this scrolls down. And this is all just for burglary. <laughs> they um, might have removal of credit <coughs> union if they were already employed by a credit union, or if they can't get employed by a credit union. Does anyone want to see another?
apparently there is no information on murder or homicide. Manslaughter, maybe? Try um, manslaughter. That's what I just put in. Did you just put in? Okay. Yeah. Are, you on, are you on offenses or impact? I was on offenses. Kidnapping. Um, are you sure? Let's just check. There you go. And like I said, this Yeah, I do. Alright. We'll start from the beginning. This is what we this is the problem we have with beta sites. They're not entirely bug free yet. Okay, so offenses. We have murder. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> um, all right, so. So as you can see from the first example, there are quite a few opportunities that you wouldn't even think of that are denied to individuals based on the crimes they commit. So the same thing um, as before, the Department of Aging says that someone who committed murder can no longer work at their facility, <coughs> as should probably be expected. Um, same with the Department of Education. Uh, murderers are apparently cannot be employed with a fundraising consultant <coughs> or a temporary bar. Apparently murderers cannot be appointed as Ohio Inspector General, which might also be helpful to note. So the list just keeps going on. Um, does it, we are going to look up at least one license, licensing that is affected. You can look up either by offense or by um, opportunity that is denied. And so <coughs> in this case, um, I typed in barber because on, in your class on Friday, this will be a very key fact to note. Um, but certain convictions uh, prevent people from receiving barber's license, even though to be a barber is one of the skills that you are trained for in prison. So. Um, the law has actually recently changed. In Ohio, if you're convicted of a felon, you can receive a barber's license, except if you are convicted of a sexual offense. In other states, this exception is not the only exception. Um, a lot of states just bar any convicted felon from receiving a barber's license. is uh, thought of as a path or a process um, in which if a person meets certain goals, uh, then they're considered reentered. Then they're considered reintegrated into society. And to be reintegrated, it typically um, means they have their own house, they can pay for their own house, um, they are gainfully, legitimately employed, meaning that they have a paying job in, that is not illegal. 
um, and they're financially stable. So basically, they're a productive member of society. But the problem with this is um, when people leave prison, they have nothing. They typically don't have employment. They most of the time come out with little to no money. I think on average, um, a prisoner is given $80 and a pair of sweatpants and released back into the world. So obviously $80 is not gonna pay for housing. It's not gonna be <coughs> any rent. It's not gonna even put down the down payment for rent. And then there are additional um, challenges to such things as <coughs> if a person is addicted to drugs and they're just thrown back into society and expected to find a drug treatment program, this can add um, stress and this can um, also deter them from reentering successfully. And so this cute little cartoon um, just shows that basically there's, there's not a lot of help out there. You're expected to get all of these things, but you're not getting help <laughs> in any of these areas except for prison. Prison has a wide open door which is why so many people recidivate. And if you don't catch all of this, um, I'm gonna be going into a little bit more detail on each of them. So for housing and employment, um, typically you need a job to get housing. However, you also need housing to get a job. When you're filling out an application, you need to be able to put a permanent address so that you can actually be reached where you're at. And um, if you don't have a permanent address, you can't really get um, housing. However, you need money in order to get housing. Wait, you, if you don't have a permanent address, you can't get employment. But you also need employment to get housing because you need money. You need to put down that security deposit. You need to be able to pay the first month's rent. So really, it's a catch-22 where you need both, but you don't have access to either. <laughs> In addition, um, there are frequently background checks on both of these. So if you're coming out of prison and you're going through the reentry process, you have another, another obstacle in your way because both housing and employment can discriminate on, uh, against you on the fact that you were convicted. <coughs> I'm doing re research right now on, um, on people who are reentering Southeast Ohio, and I've heard tons of stories where they they went to go live with their parents, amen, because if you don't have housing or employment, you can't go live on your own, and their, their own parents got kicked out of a place they were living because they had to go on the lease, and they had a convicted, they were convicted of. So, it's, it's just really a bad situation when you can't find employment or housing and as you saw from the website, partially, <laughs> what worked of the website, uh, there are so many other opportunities that are just denied to you. You can't get employment with, you know, aging department, or education, or credit unions. <coughs> Frequently, um, People will become obviously homeless, um, especially if they're from inner city. They will um, either wind up at a homeless shelter or just be living on the streets. But this presents its own problem. There are vagrancy laws. So immediately upon being homeless, the police can pick you up for you know loitering or being in the streets when you have nowhere else to go and you have nothing else to do. Um, if you list a homeless shelter as your permanent address when you're looking for employment, typically people you know, aren't, aren't a fan of that, and they'll just throw out your application right there. And then again, this is exasperated when drugs, alcohol, or mental illness is involved. Um, a lot of the cycle of homeless, uh, the homelessness problem, is actually <coughs> people who are mentally ill and should be in a facility to take care of them, but instead they're thrown back on the streets and can't really help, help themselves. <laughs> In Ohio, there's actually very few um, employment opportunities that take advantage of the fact that if you hire um, either a convicted felon or someone who just got released from jail, 
um, they will give you actually a tax break. They give the company a tax break. But very few people, um, very few companies take advantage of this, and even fewer, you know, actually seek out employ or seek out employees who have been convicted. Is it by like a state by state basis, or is it like federal? Um, it's it's actually federal. So every state has a law that like that, but most people don't take advantage of it. And then we're going to add, of course, if you add drug addiction into the mix, then the rate of um, the, basically all of these problems get exasperated. We didn't look at drug addiction on the website, however, or not, you can't look at drug addiction <laughs> because addiction is a mental illness and apparently we don't criminalize addiction. However, they do pretty much everything else, drug possession and use, um, drug trafficking, Pretty much if you're involved with drugs at all, it's criminalized, even though drug addiction is a serious mental illness. Um, but if we looked at the website for drug possession, they are some of the highest um, rate, they have some of the highest rates of discrimination. Uh, social welfare um, projects, so like if they were to apply for SNAP or food stamps, uh, most states uh, would deny people who have been convicted of drug offenses or people who have been convicted of molestation, but no other crime. Um, currently, about 45% of incarcerated nonviolent uh, offenders are for drugs. This means that almost half of the people that are in prison right now are on a drug-related offense. And part of the reason for this is because our um, laws actually make drug offenses felonies, and therefore they serve more time. This came about in 1971 um, from Nixon with the War on Drugs. The War on Drugs basically criminalized um, drug use almost entirely, and uh, put harsher sentencing on um, drug-related offenses. So now it's uh, a felony, a class felony, a class by felony to have um, and I think five ounces of cocaine on you. So personal use of crack and cocaine, um, both are classified felonies. In addition, um, there are three, or many states, this is state dependent, many states have three strike laws. So if a person is convicted two times of a major crime, such as a felony for drug possession, um, and then they get in trouble, typically for anything out from the third strike, they are required to have harsher sentencing, which means a lot of times <coughs> guys will be um, drug addicts, you know, get caught on possession twice, <coughs> and then go back on, you know, a measly, measly crime of like vagrancy, and then they get hit really hard. With this being said, um, because of such things, we are throwing uh, the, you know, uh, drug addicted population in jail, and therefore drug use over the past three decades has declined drastically. I know you guys have talked at least a little bit about recidivism. So I'm not going to harp on it too much, but really the result of an unsuccessful reentry program is the, the um, high rates of recidivism. And recidivism, like I said, I know you guys know this, refers to a person's relapse into criminal behavior, often after the person receives sanctions or undergoes intervention for a previous crime. Currently, we measure recidivism on a three-year cohort. So if, if someone is released in 2005, we say in, on average in three years, it is seven out of 10 times likely, or seven out of 10 of them will be back in prison.
recidivism rates because this is really where um, reentry comes into play. If we can successfully get people to reenter, they're not recidivating. Um, and 70.7% of released offenders are rearrested uh, for a new crime within three years. This number varies. Um, you see anywhere from about 64 to 74%, uh, but on average, we like to think of two-thirds or seven out of 10 people who are released from prison will recidivate and be rearrested. Of them, um, it obviously varies by crime. And this is important to note, at least the order of things for your exam. In um, so like someone who is released for homicide is has a way lower rate of recidivism. They're less likely to commit another homicide or commit um, another crime in general, which is good, good news to think about, you know, at least if we're releasing someone who's committed, you know, who's murdered someone else, they're not, they're not likely to do it again, not as likely to do it again. Um, however, rape and drug possession are obviously not as helpful to look at. And the most common um, crime that when people get out, they reoffend is motor vehicle theft. So what can we do to fix this? Frequently, um, the responsibility for reentry falls on people's social support network. Um, like I said, I'm doing research in this area, and of the people I've talked to, I've, almost every single one of them lives with either parents, um, parent-in-laws, which is interesting to me, uh, grandparents, siblings, just people that they knew before they went into prison. Um, specifically because in this area of Ohio, we don't have homeless shelters. We don't have all of these resources for someone to go out into the world and find, you know, employment and find housing. <coughs> of the available um, reentry programs out there, most of them are faith-based therefore not funded by the government. Um, and that's to mention, like, basically groups will get together, put together backpacks for these guys, um, help with clothing drives, and allow them to come get clothes when they get out. Um, these sort of programs are not very frequent, though. note though is down here um, the employment uh, family and friends have actually been cited as uh, the highest rate of how people get jobs so how people get jobs is who they know um, a lot of the guys I talk to will say yeah I got this job because my friend Rob is a manager there or my friend so-and-so told me about this and so um, family and friends aren't just clothing and housing and feeding these people they're also out there helping them with so social support, helping them navigate the world. And if people don't have social support, this is, those are the people that are going to end up homeless. Those are the people that aren't going to have um, a successful reentry. Okay, as I mentioned, um, there aren't a lot of federally, federally funded programs. Um, however, this is starting to change. And this is changing because of the Second Chance Act. Uh, the Second Chance Act was signed into law by, Bush, uh, by President Bush on April 9, 2008. And what it does, this is really important to note what it does, um, it provides funding to local organizations that help with the re-entry re process. Let me repeat that. 
It provides funding to local organizations that help with the re-entry re process. a grant-based program, so um, most of the time someone has to have the idea to have a re-entry program, and then they have to apply for a grant, and then that grant is either given or denied based upon the requirements. And so because of that, it's not actually um, universal. So the re-entry programs that are available, say here in southeast or eastern Ohio, aren't the same as the ones maybe in Cincinnati or Columbus. universalize everything. Any other ideas of how we fix reentry? Okay, let me ask you this. Why aren't we fixing reentry? Why aren't there more programs out there to help these people who are reentry? money to be made by incarcerating people. <coughs> Any other ideas? What do you guys think about drug treatment programs? What should we do with um, those who are addicted to drugs and instead of getting help, get incarcerated? I wanted to mention that the uh, reentry program here in Athens is called HACCAP. It's a uh, Hockey and Athens Carry Community Action, uh, community action Program. And um, it is trying. It is, it is one of the few in the area that are, is actually trying to help with reentry. So, any questions? <coughs> anyone that did not get a, an evaluation form? 